So um, Caitlin Urso, I have been Colorado SBAP for 10 years now. I started in 2014. Um, I started at the, the staff level. Um, Christine Hofler and I were, were colleagues for a um, very long time, about nine of those years. Um, and now I am the manager of the SBAP program. And I have two great staff members. Jarrett is one. Um, Jesse Walters is the other. I think she's on the call as well um, and attended the, the annual conference uh, with you guys. I was unable to be there, but I was super happy that our two new staff got to be there. So what we're talking about today is the new natural medicines uh, legalization in Colorado and the subsequent environmental impacts and recommendations. Um, so one of the roles that the Colorado SBAP plays um, is when we have new emerging industries, especially when they're Colorado specific, um, our program typically looks at all of the environmental impacts and then makes recommendations to make sure that we're sustainable from the start with our rules. Uh, Mark mentioned previous to natural medicines, I worked on the cannabis industry quite a bit. I did that for uh, four years because uh, there was a lot of environmental impacts with the cannabis industry, um, even through covering what federal EPA couldn't cover with answering questions about what are the emission factors from cultivating cannabis within an urban environment, Knox rich environment, you know, what are the contributions of these new VOCs? So taking that lens of our, our, our program, what we're going to talk about today is Specifically, you know, how Colorado does SBAP because it's, it's different in every state, um, you know, kind of give you a little bit of an overview on that, but you're certainly welcome to ask more questions about that at the end of the presentation as well. Um, and then we'll specifically talk about the environmental impacts uh, and best practices that we discovered for, for natural medicines, um, specifically psilocybin mushrooms, which is the first natural medicine to be legalized in Colorado. There's, there's six total, maybe four. Um, but they're they're phasing them in. So psilocybin mushrooms is the first uh, of many for us to address. And so when we look at environmental impacts of a new industry, Colorado really tries to take a step back and say, OK, what are we going to assess? And I always even put my hand up for the big five um, energy, air, water, waste and land use. If we are holistically um, looking at the environmental inputs and outputs in all five of these categories, we're holistically covering the environmental impacts of an industry. So next slide, Jared. So specifically Colorado SBAP, we kind of break up our work 50-50. 50% -50. Um, is assistance requests, um, and then 50% is research projects for industry of focus, industries of focus to kind of help proactive um, environmental sustainability for that industry. So past industries of focus, cannabis industry being one. Um, previous to that, I did uh, intensive two years with craft brewing in Colorado because we have a lot of craft breweries. Um, I focused on data centers, dry cleaners, auto body shops. Um, Christine in the past focused on implementing the VW settlement funds as her project. Uh, this year, uh, Jesse is going to be focusing on food waste and Jared's main focus is basically energy efficiency for hospitals and schools. So um, that's kind of how we, we run our industries of focus. Natural medicines is one of those industries of focus. The other 50% is literally just answering technical questions that come to us, like what permit do I need? How do I calculate emissions? All of the things that I'm sure a lot of you do day to day. So basically free environmental consulting. Next slide. So specifically for the natural um, medicines for psilocybin mushrooms, the energy impacts are mostly heating equipment needed for sterilization of both the tools and the substrate. The substrate is basically the media that we grow the mushrooms in. So when we say substrate, it's, it's like growing plants in dirt. Your substrate would be the dirt. But substrate in, in mushroom cultivation is typically a mix of like grains, um, and some nutrients pretty much. And so you're gonna use the larger facilities will have autoclaves, basically large pressure cookers. Um, they did legalize at home production, basically personal production as well. Those folks would be using smaller pressure cookers. Um, there may be boilers on site for larger sterilization as well. 
the energy demands um, for the actual cultivation are mostly just for humidity or for climate control. So your humidity is, um, you know, really high for mushrooms because you're not irrigating mushrooms. You're not actually like applying water like you would in, to cannabis plants. I'll make a lot of comparisons because it's very similar. That's how we made this assessment. Um, so you want about 80% humidity, 65 degrees. Mushrooms don't require really intensive lighting like cannabis does. So we don't need those high wattage um, lights. We can pretty much use LEDs or fluorescent lights 12 hours on, 12 hours off, um, not the crazy lighting schedules that we have with cannabis. Some product storage for uh, refrigeration and things like that after it, a lot of the product ends up being dried and kind of putting into a powder and capsules. So sometimes that isn't necessary. HEPA filtration for intake and exhaust air, uh, that's mostly to address the mushroom spores uh, that are, that are gonna be present. Uh, but that adds to our energy profile. It takes more energy to pull through a filter than it does an open HVAC exhaust. So as a fellow SBAPR, when you're going to, and looking at a new industry or maybe an industry that your business that you're just not familiar with, when you look at the energy impacts, look at what are the, the highest demand equipment that they're using. It's usually HVAC, heating, refrigeration in some capacity. Who, heating and cooling seem to be the largest any impacts in any um, industry. Lighting can kind of be a third thing depending on you know the type of industry. Next. So knowing those in, uh, energy impacts, the best practices are to try to be energy efficient. Um, using proper insulation uh, in the grow environment, we've seen some, like we saw one practice that was just kind of using their grow space was blocked off by plastic. And so they weren't getting good temperature insulation and it was inside of like a, not like a warehouse kind of garage, like it wasn't good climate control. So having proper insulated grow space, uh, timed lighting, LEDs are best, efficient equipment and HVAC that's designed for high humidity and keeping that consistent temperature is going to be best. Here in Colorado, because we have such a dry climate, oftentimes this temperature and humidity can be um, done with just um, basically swamp coolers. Like we, we don't necessarily have to air condition for this because we are such a dry climate, not necessarily possible all over the country. Um, On-site renewables, if possible, these are gonna be really small facilities, nowhere near the size of cannabis production facilities, uh, a very small amount of mushrooms to be grown for a lot of psilocybin medical properties, um, not near the amounts of cannabis, so a much smaller impact. So RECs, maybe uh, renewable energy credits might be the better route to go just because it's a, such a small footprint. Next. So the air impacts of, of mushroom cultivation, uh, mushrooms are unique in, in kind of the growing environment in that they release carbon dioxide um, during the growing process. So they take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide similar to people versus plants, you know, take in oxygen and release CO2. Um, because they're releasing CO2, this can lead to a high CO2 environment in a small grow room. There's not gonna be odors uh, from the mushrooms typically themselves. It's mostly gonna be the compost and the fertilizers that are used in the cultivation. It's not like the plant versus, you know, cannabis where the plant itself is really odorous. Uh, Sterilization rooms, they need to be pretty sterile to, to not contaminate spores. And um, also the mushrooms can be really vulnerable to like bacterias and molds and things like that. So they have to keep a sterile environment. So they're probably gonna use um, alcohol, bleach, I'm assuming like isopropyl ozone generators all for sterilization. So those are things to be aware of. Cultivation itself falls under the agricultural exemption, um, similar to cannabis, where the cultivation itself is agriculturally exempt from uh, APEN and air reporting. However, the solvent used in manufacturing of concentrates, so once you, you know, if you use solvents to extract psilocybin from the actual plant mushroom itself, um, that use of solvents is subject uh, to air emissions reporting. Um, and record keeping and all of the air requirements because that is a manufacturing process. That's the line with cannabis as well. 
Growing the plants is agriculturally exempt. As soon as it hits manufacturing that plant into a different product, you're no longer agriculturally exempt and that's what triggers the air emissions. Next slide. So the best practices uh, for, for air, CO2 monitors with safety alarms because of those uh, the, them releasing CO2, ensuring proper air exchange rates um, to prevent that buildup in, in the room, having HEPA filters to reduce the contamination risk in the sterile rooms, um, which can also reduce the need for pesticides and, and other things that you would have to apply to them themselves if you're not just keeping a sterile environment. Really important N95 um, protection for workers when they're in the cultivation uh, space to prevent mushroom workers' lung. So we wanna be aware as we're doing SBAP assess assess assessments, if there is a big health indicator, we wanna mention it um, along with our environmental recommendations. Um, and then there's a potential need for HEPA filtration of the cultivation exhaust air leaving the facility because mushroom spores can spread and refruit. So if we're pushing spores outside of the facility exhaust, depending on where that facility is, that could be a high risk, like say near a playground if spores landed on and then could refruit. So we wanna make sure that we're not and this could be achieved through zoning as well, um, but we want to make sure that we're not exhausting spores. Next. So the water impacts from this, uh, pretty low in the fact that there's, we're not, we don't have irrigation runoff. Um, we're really, the biggest water usage is for humidification and sterilization, um, not high water contamination there, more just usage. Uh, there's no water, water runoff since we're not doing um, e irrigation systems essentially. Like they just grow in the substrate in a high humidity environment and that's the water that they take in versus adding water and then having excess water flow off. However, um, there's potential water contamination certainly if we have allowed outdoor cultivation. Um, one of the biggest lessons from all of these impacts and recommendations was that it needs to be indoors so that it can be controlled primarily for spores and also the psilocybin, the med medicinal characteristic, the drug that can cause um, psychoactive impacts. <laughs> um, spores are pretty small um, and they can be filtered. However, we wanna be careful about once we filter that out at the water treatment plant or wherever, um, then if we're land applying sludge can those spores refruit from the sludge? Yes, we, we just wanna be careful about spore. Spore spreading is the main thing. Um, next. So best practices, uh, potential secondary containment, basically side streaming of manufacturing rinse water where they're actually making the psilocybin concentrates. Um, just in case there's high psilocybin in that in that water, we know that psilocybin is water soluble and so it can dissolve in the water. However, the lifespan of how long it survives in water is a little blurry. Um, it's short, like under a week, but um, you know that it can be sped up with things like heating and things and other properties. Um, but essentially it is water soluble. And so we want to make sure that we're not adding concentrations to the water treatment plant that they can't handle. Basically, more research needs to be done on that. Uh, indoor cultivation to prevent water runoff um, and contamination. Again, we don't want to do this outdoors because we can't contain it. No pretreatment is needed for the water that we're using for humidification and sterilization. Tap water is fine. It's up to drinking water standards. No need to further treat that water. Um, and making sure we have efficient humidification systems so we're not using excess water. Next. The waste impacts. Uh, our cultivation waste is basically going to be the substrate, again, like the grains that we're growing, the, the mushrooms in themselves, where the mycelia kind of take over. Uh, sterilization equipment, um, personal protective equipment, gloves, masks, packing bags, leftover products that fail or products that fail uh, testing. For concentrate manufacturers, if they're using solvents and waste chemicals, there needs to be a hazardous waste determination. Solvents are going to be a hazardous waste. 
uh, potential composting contamination from spores in the substrate. So after each grow, they essentially they can compost the substrate because it's really nutrient dense, doesn't need to be landfilled. However, uh, there's spores within it. And so we before composting, we need to have a, a solution so that we're not spreading spores. Uh, and then there's going to be the product packaging as well. Next one. So the best practices uh, for waste is, again, because we don't want spores contaminating through compost and through waste, uh, we, we think that they need to be autoclaved, um, basically heated uh, for, and for a time period of about 20 minutes. We also offered um, some lime baths, but they already have the autoclaving for sterilization. So it seems like the better, more popular route. Uh, leftover products that fail testing must be destroyed before composting. Uh, so we're not spreading psilocybin concentrations into the environment. Spent solvents, hazardous waste, uh, reusable packaging should be mandatory, we think, because there's really no product that's leaving the facility or center. So the legalization structure of natural medicines is very different than that of cannabis here in Colorado. You can't just, as a consumer, you're not going to be able to just go to a store and buy psilocybin mushrooms like you can cannabis. Um, you're going to have to go to a healing center um, and they monitor like your experience if you want to go to the, the commercial route. Otherwise, there is provisions for, for home cultivation and, and use, um, which would not require packaging. So we think, uh, you know, reusable packaging is possible. And then recycling plastic waste used in cultivation and manufacturing. Land use back impacts the, um, not a lot because they should be grown indoors uh, to prevent the spore spreading and the water contamination. Uh, spores can travel through the air. I think there was a study, uh, at the end of this, we have resources, uh, resource slides that we left in there for you guys if you wanna really dig into this, but. The spores can travel about 15 miles through the air. They travel through the water, they travel through the waste. Um, they survive very long and can refruit. So say there was some in the composting pile at the commercial composter that didn't fruit there, but then uh, got sent to a, a farm that's for say vegetables, you could get spores, uh, mushroom spores fruiting there where we don't want them. Um, also, Colorado does not have the best climate for outdoor cultivation or greenhouses of mushrooms. Um, we have pretty harsh climate. And even in the summer, it's like too hot and dry. They like cold and humid. Um, so indoor cultivation offers safety and security. And it's a small indoor footprint because it's not going to be nearly the volumes that we've seen from like cannabis. Next. So uh, zoning restrictions uh, could address some of these concerns. As I mentioned before, some of the spore spreading might not be a concern if it's zoned industrial and is you know too far away from vulnerable communities or you know land that could be um, subject to spores. Um, and so it should be grown indoors. That's it for that one. So I'll pass it off to Jarrett um, to kind of talk about the process of how you know, and, and what we, what recommendations we made for the actual regulatory structure. So Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment was where SBAP sits, advises the Colorado Department of Revenue who regulates liquor, marijuana, now natural medicines, psilocybin mushrooms on how to make those regulations more environmentally conscious. Yeah, so uh, just like Caitlin said prior, we have an initial sustainability analysis that we like to do for uh, kind of newer industries to see how we can help. So now that we have that process kind of covered, I'm gonna walk you through the steps of how we implemented that towards regulatory implementation with the rule writing process for the Department of uh, Revenue for Colorado. And please excuse the slides. My computer reset, so my Zoom is all weird and my slides are on one screen, my things are on everything else, so bear with me. Um, okay, so out of everything that we had um, from Caitlin's side, these were the six recommendations that we were able to pull that we wanted to um, sort of 
give off to hand off to the uh, Department of Revenue. So the first one that we uh, the first recommendation we made um, was to require CO2 monitors. Like Caitlin had mentioned, um, CO2 or mushrooms are similar to humans when they take in oxygen and release CO2. So we felt that is something that is very important that we wanted to bring to the attention of the DOR to make sure that it is included in the rule language. And then that sa um, similar safety measures also carry over for the N95 masks. Um, these are definitely to help reduce um, inhalation issues, especially around spores, because you can get bad infections in your lungs. And we wanna make sure that that's appropriately taken care of because not many people knew about this. And then the third uh, recommendation we have is also what Caitlin mentioned about sterilizing the um, compost or any substrate that you wanna compost. We really wanna make sure that psilocybin mushrooms do not spread. Um, when we were doing a lot of our outreach and working with smaller businesses that were in the mushroom cultivation industry, they mentioned that psilocybin mushrooms can spread and you really need to make it a point to destroy the substrate because we had people prior tell us they didn't destroy a substrate completely and then they started growing mushrooms in their backyard. So we really wanted to make a point of that. Um, and then the third one is outside of worker safety and more so outside of spore spreading. And that was like Caitlin mentioned with the HEPA filters for the exhaust venting. Um, so we're still kind of figuring out how we want to do that. But if you do grow inside of the grow media bags, it's not as big of an issue. So there are ways around that. And then the other issue we had was water contamination. Um, that is a very big one. So we have recommendations that we have for the rule language that I will cover later. And then like Caitlin said, with reusable packaging, since it isn't going to be consumer based to where someone can go in a shop and just buy mushrooms or any kind of natural medicine, we feel like you should have reusable um, packaging because it's gonna just refill and it's not taken home. It doesn't need to have any kind of child safety constraints. So the first recommendation we have um, was we wanted to make sure that people that have healing centers or are gonna cultivate or grow mushrooms, touch base and check with their local um, wastewater process or water treatment facilities. Water treatment facilities can have standards or regulations above and beyond state regulations and every single water facility can have different regulations. So we wanted to make it a point to tell people that they should reach out to their local wastewater um, facility in their area so that we can make sure all of their requirements are being met and any kind of water that could be contaminated by psilocybin, they would have other recommendations for us. So we made that uh, recommendation to this rule language supplied by uh, DOR. And then the second rule language we made, which we thought fit well in this area was again for waste disposal. And this was the waste disposal for um, the substrates or any kind of leftover media material. And like Caitlin mentioned earlier, um, our recommendation for this was to make sure that Anybody that has this kind of material has a time requirement, a heat requirement to make sure that anything inside of the com compost is neutralized. And then uh, kind of just setting up restrictions or requirements for composting. And then again, this was another area of the same kind of setup. So we just wanted to reiterate whenever there is anything that has to do with composting or leftover media material, that it has to go through these specific requirements. Our biggest thing is to really hammer in the time requirements, the heat requirements to make sure that everything is completely neutralized because the last thing we want is any of this spreading. So when we went through any of the rule language, we really went through the fine tooth comb and we reiterated, yeah, we did say this twice, but we felt this was a very big need to, and this area was specific for it. Um, this was a rule recommendation we had again for the N95 workers masks, um, basically just to ensure that anybody that is in a grow room is not inhaling any kind of spores that can cause any kind of lung infections or sickness. Um, so we wanted to throw this into the rule language and make sure that they had to have a mask if they were in the grow room for any kind of amount of over like extended time working in the field. Um, and then this one is kind of like setting them up to for future compliance. 
So this recommendation was uh, kind of working towards air compliance. Um, so a lot of people in this industry might not necessarily know that they might fall under air compliance or air regulations. So we made a recommendation to the DOR for their rule language to require anybody at a natural healing facility to just keep SDS sheets and kind of quantity, quantify the amount of any kind of solvents or uh, stuff like that or chemicals that they are using in case they do get audited and they do need to find out any stuff like that for hazardous waste or air emissions. That way it kind of saves them time, especially because this is a newer industry for a lot of people. And in a lot of the stakeholder groups, there weren't necessarily people that were so far focused on air regulation. So we wanted to kind of point this out to them. Um, and this kind of goes back to, again, what Caitlin mentioned earlier with uh, mushrooms, breathing in oxygen and exhaling CO2. This was another recommendation we wanted to make towards their rule language to ensure that there are CO2 monitors at eye level in all of the rooms just as another safety precaution for anybody that is working inside of a grow room. Um, we wanna just reiterate as much as we could again, worker safety. Um, another one that we wanted to kind of give a heads up for, this doesn't necessarily apply to the natural medicines, but it's more so towards the industry. A lot of those people in that industry have are getting pulled in many different directions. So we wanted to mention in the rule language that not only will they be getting um, inspected by different kinds of departments like the fire department or code enforcement, but we also wanted to suggest that they might be getting inspected by state food and safety and environmental divisions because they are creating a product for consumption. And like I mentioned earlier, they might potentially have air emissions based off the solvents they use if they have any kind of like process for creating concentrates or something like that. So we just wanted to make sure to put that on their radar and try to find everything we could that could help them. And then that kind of leads into this uh, last recommendation for the transport manifest. So the DOR wanted to have anybody transporting natural medicines to have a manifest of anything they have, where they're going, any of that stuff. And we just wanted to include some extra recommendations in the manifest for the waste that kind of outlines how the waste was um, composted, taken care of, neutralized, what process the waste is in, just so we know how to handle that waste because spores can spread so fast and you can just start growing mushrooms everywhere. We thought it'd be a great idea to kind of have that set in the book for the manifest. Um, and this kind of just outlines our timeline for the rulemaking. So, so far we're about halfway through. Uh, most of our recommendations came from our initial sustainability analysis. Um, and we still might have some more recommendations to come for future meetings, especially about cultivation and manufacturing and testing facility requirements. Um, so we're kind of just seeing what the measures are gonna be. Right now we feel like most of the uh, recommendations we made around natural medicines are kind of there. I feel like a lot of the other recommendations we'll be making are kind of towards more regulatory compliance around how they can find ways for setting themselves up around air compliance or if they have any hazardous waste or water effluent wastes. Um, so we would check for recommendations around that. And then these are kind of some major questions we still have left over. So for the concentration of natural medicines into like smaller concentrates, like maybe gummies or something, um, we're kind of wondering if they should restrict solvent use similar to they did, similar to how they did for the marijuana industry, um, or if they want to do it similar to how they did with the hemp industry. And then the second one is a big one that we mentioned, and that's the uh, solubility of psilocybin in water and working with your local water treatment facilities. At this point in time, like there's, this, this is such an emerging industry that a lot of the science behind this is kind of basement science. So when we do get a chance to work with real scientists that are studying this, we're asking as much as we can, but we're slowly finding that there's a lot of unanswered questions still, especially around this community, just because it is just now going into regulation. So um, this is one of our big unanswered questions. And then the third one is if we really do need to have HEPA filters for uh, cultivation exhaust. One of the reasons why we don't think we may need that is just because in an open room, grow room, yes, 
But if you have the uh, mixed media grow bags, you don't necessarily have these issues because they have small filters within them that regulate the spore dispersal. So that can save you a lot of issues by just using these bags. So kind of leaves questions and ball in your court if you want to use it or not. But that's kind of the big three things we have left over. Um, and we can open it up for any questions now, if anyone has any. Any any questions? Um, let me see if anyone's got their hands up. Well, while we wait for other people, um, did you have to integrate some of your requirements um, with the Colorado DPHE with the FDA? Did the FDA have any specific requirements that might raise some environmental impact? Um, so let's, oh, I, I can start and then Caitlin can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so from my understanding, this is a state regulation and it's not impacted by federal oversee at all. Um, actually in our planning for this, we had a grow facility reach out to us that was contracted under the federal government. And they kind of filled us in a little bit more on their guidelines, but the federal government is doing their own thing and they're way above us on this. So this is kind of a state level thing from my understanding. Um, but the federal government is looking into it and they do have standards. They're kind of, Caitlin might be able to fill you in a little more on those, but we didn't really have any federal intervention at all. Yeah, so the on the federal level, the federal government um, does license facilities one of them being in Colorado that, that um, we were lucky enough to work with, um, basically for medical research for psilocybin. Uh, so they're they're basically doing like medical pharmaceutical research, but the facility is also overseen by DEA and and things like that. Like they even have to have a vault on site to regulate these the content of this mushroom production. Um, but anyways, on the state side. This is similar to the conundrum we had with cannabis, where it's federally illegal. Cannabis is still federally illegal. Um, however, it's state legalized. And similar to psilocybin mushrooms, federally illegal, state legalized. And so the state has to kind of provide all of the same protections for our citizens as if it was federally overseen. So what I'm trying to get at is from a food safety aspect, our state level food safety team certainly applies similar regulations as they would at the federal level for food safety standards. Um, however, FDA is not involved at all because it's federally illegal, similar to how EPA is not involved at all, similar to cannabis. Cannabis is EP, no EPA oversight. Okay, yeah, thank you for that explanation. Um, looking for any hands up. Oh, Tony, yeah, hello, hey. Um, so with the state having oversight and not the feds, and again, this may show ignorance on my part, is there a, a specified solvent? And I don't recall if the solvent's used to extract um, the active ingredient from the mushroom? Is there a specified solvent they have to use or a range of solvents? So currently, no. Um, we we did ask them that to consider that question if they would want to restrict solvents to marijuana is five. It's like uh, propane, butane, ethanol, pentane, and heptane. Those are the only ones that can be used for marijuana. Um, however, for hemp, for instance, it's a lot more wide ranging what can be used for hemp and it just has to be food safe solvents. So a popular hemp extraction solvent, for instance, is hexane. Hexane is food safe. However, it is a hazardous air pollutant. So they can use it on food safe products. However, it's uh, it's a reportable half, um, and certainly in the quantities that they want to use it, it becomes very expensive. So I take it they typically don't use hexane for this type of activity. 
No, what we've what we've seen from for the most part is it's mostly like ethyl ethanol, like uh, alcohol based extraction. Some pressurization with it. Some just like more like soaking the mushrooms in basically alcohol. Um, it pulls out the psilocybin and then basically fil filtering out the chunks of mushrooms essentially, and then you're consuming that as like a liquid tincture as a consumer versus like actually putting it into a gummy or something else. <clears throat> okay. Um... There's going to be a lot smaller range of products, I believe, from the mushroom industry uh, just because of the structure of it being distributed only at healing centers where your own, you can't take leftover product home or anything. You just, you're given the product there. You're held there for the complete experience. Um, and then you leave without any product, um, is, is kind of the commercial distribution network. So much, much smaller than cannabis. So again, um, pardoning my ignorance, um, you, eat it you drink it you smoke it you some other way of ingesting yeah, all of the above just typically they don't smoke it um i, I think that actually be kind of bad i don't think they do that Majera's going yeah they don't do that um but more eating it so it you know it, it might be in like baked goods or in a like they will freeze dry it um and create a powder and then put that powder in like little capsules so you're just like taking a pill or something like that um or like i said kind of like picture like a dropper of essential oils kind of like that or that you might take like three drops out of a vial of alcohol that was soaked with mushrooms yeah and that's that's not to say that they might make a vape or something but like i would highly 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 recommend not smoking mushrooms that's very bad for you um, okay so if they made it into capsules, they would have to consume the capsules yes. at, on the premises. Yeah. So everything right. done at the healing center has to be um, consumed on premises. Leftovers cannot be taken home. But if you grow it at home, then. It's the it's, wild west. It's the wild <laughs> west. Because <laughs> we can only regulate businesses. We cannot regulate individual citizens and then it, it looks like michael has a question in the chat other than n95 requirements are there any other ppe like clothing coverings to prevent the workers from transmitting the spores um honestly from what we've seen basically the thing is just the mask um because the biggest is the health issue the spores i feel like they would just stick to your clothes and then kind of just get stuck or stick to your skin. Our biggest thing is we just don't want them to get caught in the air and catch air currents and travel out or get to other grower medias. Um, that is a good question. It didn't really pop up to me, but in a lot also of the research- Also gloves. Done, gloves yeah. for um, psilocybin dermal exposure. Um, I think at high concentrations in liquid, you could get some dermal exposure. So just like when directly working with them, gloves. Yeah, other Actually, than that. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no problem. Actually, Michael's question kind of reminded me uh, uh, with inspections. And again, I don't know how frequently you inspect these facilities, but if you're going from one to another, is there a potential for cross contamination? Yes. So, similar to cannabis facilities, um, we would probably make it a be best practice to only visit one cultivation per day. Um, cannabis cultivations often make that a mandatory requirement. Uh, often they'll even ask you, have you been working in your own garden this morning? And then like make you, you know, wear booty covers on your shoes and wash your hands before you go into the grow kind of thing. Um, so they're, they're very vulnerable to, um, bacteria and like yeasts and molds, um, that spread from mushroom to mushroom. So you could take like that's the other advantage of them growing in grow bags is it creates kind of like a microclimate in each little grow bag. So if one batch of mushrooms or one substrate was contaminated with something, it doesn't contaminate the entire cultivation room. It's just that bag. 
um, and it doesn't have the opportunity to spread. So similar, if we went from a bagged cultivation to a bag cultivation, I would be less concerned about spreading. However, if we went from open fruiting to open fruiting, wouldn't want to do that in the same day, like need to change clothes and shower and things like that. Um, thank you very much uh, for both of you for your explanation. Um, I don't know if I'm missing anyone who has a question. Um, I definitely missed Michael's. Uh, thank you for putting it in the chat. Well, and you guys are welcome to um, ask any questions too about you know how Colorado SBAP functions differently than your SBAP. Doesn't necessarily have to be on crazy mushrooms. Well, again, I appreciate um, you, Caitlin. Um, you had suggested a lot of great ideas and, and speakers, and you know, you know, a couple of them were able to be available at the annual conference. And so I appreciate uh, that. I appreciate both of you and you, including Jarrett, um, the time you took to put together this presentation and your delivery today. I, I generally I'm, am very interested in trying to encourage other states to who normally wouldn't participate or share what they do, um, because I'm I'm hoping that this is considered a national SBAP. And people who have regional is issues are willing to open that up to the group um, rather than just keep it to themselves. So with that being said, um, next month's presentation, I will feature Tony and a couple of other people. And I think it includes formaldehyde and trichloroethylene and so it sounds super exciting i don't know if i don't want to put tony on the spot but um oh you can do that um yeah we're gonna have two really high level speakers talking about uh tosca and epa banning solvents and one of them specializes in chlorinated solvents so he's going to talk about perk and trichloroethylene and uh, other stuff and then um one of them specializes in formaldehyde. He works for Hexion. And he happens to be the guy that used to be the executive director for APCA. And that's how we met him and knew him. And that's how he ended up being deputy uh, air administrator. And that's how we got Bill Wareham to do all the stuff for us um, to make SBEEPs better. So it'll be interesting. Yes, thank you for that teaser, and hopefully um, that draws interest from those participating today to attend and those who were unable to participate to consider greatly attending and, and listening in. Uh, yeah, thank you, Tony. Um, I don't have any parting thoughts, so I guess without further ado, have a great afternoon and see you next month.